Welcome, everybody. My name is J. Peter Bogosian. I am the host of the podcast, This Queer Book Saved My Life. I am also a member of the board of the International Armenian Literary Alliance. And we, on behalf of the board and the Hyphen Collective, I welcome you here today for our event, Queering Form. The International Armenian Literary Alliance, we are an international organization that supports and celebrates writers by fostering the development and distribution of Armenian literature in the English language. What I really appreciate about Yala is from the get-go, the organization has been very supportive and wanting to support as well queer writers, and we have done so through annual events every June since the inception of Yala, looking to hold up queer writers and queer publishers, and here today we're going to be talking about queering form. We also have a queer Armenian committee, which also demonstrates the commitment that we have to queer writers. And that committee is going to be offering some workshops and other events later on this year. So please stay tuned to our website, armenianliterary.org. You can also there sign up for our email newsletter, which is gonna have all of the events that we have, not only related to uh, the queer Armenian committee, but also for other events that we have, including our mentorship program and our Young Armenian Poets Awards. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to our facilitator for this conversation today, Gabe Mugalian. Gabe is a creator and facilitator of workshops on LGBTQ plus inclusion and has since sought ways to celebrate queerness in Armenian culture through art, dialogue, and advocacy. Please welcome Gabe. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you, JP. That sounds so legit when you say it like that. Um, I don't have a fancy microphone but I hope that y'all can hear me. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this. This is my first time kind of moderating something like this. So excuse the cheek that I will no doubt bring to this. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce the event a little bit and I'll introduce myself. My name is Gabe, as JP said, I'm a member of the Hyphen Collective, although I'm not speaking, I'm gonna pretend that I'm not today. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> this event came together because we really wanted to explore all these different works that we're going to be discussing today and how they relate to one another, even though they are very different types of works. Um, we have research, we have literature, we have a zine, but it's all sort of ethnography. It's all sort of revolving around, um, developing a more nuanced understanding of Armenian queerness, which I'm sure we're all excited to do. I see so many familiar faces in the audience, so that's really cool. Um, all these works explore identity, they explore relationships, um, relationships to ourselves, relationships to one another, um, and how we kind of exist in this world and in our communities. So I won't drive that home too hard. You've all read the description. You all know why you're here. So I'm just going to get into it, and I'm going to pass it over to Rosie, who's going to start discussing their research on queer Armenian diaspora and communities, and um, they're going to be the first reader today. Thank you, Rosie. Hi, thank you. Okay. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. My parents and my older brother came to LA to escape the civil war in Lebanon in the 1980s, a month before I was born. Naturally, when the war ended, my parents wanted to move back home, which is what we did in 1992. I had attended an Armenian school in LA, which emphasized one essential truth, I was Armenian. Yet when I entered my third grade class in Beirut, Lebanon, in an Armenian school, in a room full of Lebanese Armenians, I was now the American, Ameri Gatsin. The other students would look at me in English class to see how I pronounced words as if I knew better than the teacher simply because I had an American accent. Five years later, my parents decided to move back to LA to ensure a better future for me and my brother. I entered my ninth grade class in Los Angeles, California in an Armenian school, and I was now the Lebanese, the FOB. In all these scenarios, Armenian was always the given, but what type of Armenian was up for debate? I spent most of my high school years trying to prove that I was American while not knowing how to let go of being Lebanese. 
I went from being the go-to for all things English in Lebanon to being mocked for mispronouncing words in Los Angeles. One day we were reading the adventures of Huckleberry Finn in class. Lucky me, the passage I had to read out loud included the word orgies. Never having heard that word before, I pronounced it orgies. The classroom erupted in <laughs> I can see JP laughing, which made me laugh. The classroom erupted in laughter. I laughed too, pretending I hadn't just made a mistake. It would be the first of many times that I would display more fobness than Americanness. My impeccable Armenian, on the other hand, impressed no one. In my life, I've gone from identifying as Armenian in America to American in Lebanon to Lebanese in America, to finally realizing I'm a Lebanese type of Armenian and an Armenian type of American. My story always resonated with queer Armenians during our conversations. It seems that every Armenian in the diaspora has hyphens. These sub-ethnic components are among the most striking aspects of the Armenian diaspora community. For example, Armenian Americans have ethnic counterparts of different national origins, such as Armenia, Iran, Lebanon, Turkey, and various other countries. The majority of LGBTQ Armenians in my book identified as Armenian when asked about their ethnicity. Some included the nuances such as their sub-ethnicities, their non-Armenian ethnicity if both parents weren't Armenian, the countries they were born in, and their nationalities. For example, they would say, I'm an Armenian from Turkey. I'm an Armenian born in Iran. I'm Armenian, but my family's from Lebanon. I used to say I'm Hayastansi and Beirutsi just so people get a full glimpse. I'd say that my background is Armenian or that I'm of Armenian heritage. Sometimes I say Armenian American. What does it mean to be American for a generation of Armenians who are the first to establish themselves in a country initially foreign to their parents? For one gay man in his 60s who moved to the United States in his 20s, it meant a chance at life. He said, if it weren't for the United States, I couldn't be this. This being the safe life he has, the fact that he got to marry his husband and have an open life. This was a sentiment shared by many across all ages, indicating the opportunities the United States has given them to simply exist. A common sentiment shared by LGBTQ Armenians is the feeling that there was something different about them growing up without the ability to pinpoint why or what that was. Growing up in a tight-knit community with the older queer generation more likely to be closeted and or distant from the diasporic group, there was no visible queerness, queer lives, queer families, or education regarding gender and sexuality. So generations of queer Armenians grew up thinking they were the only queer Armenians unsure of their feelings, unable to explain what was going on inside them. I just knew that there was something, that for some reason I couldn't fit in, that my clothes were never right, that I was just different. I knew I was gay and I felt like I'm something very rare and unique and wrong and unusual. As a result of years of not quite fitting in, they tended to be lonely and not have friends who were also confidants. A life of secrecy and solitude led to one of independence in all aspects of life. Across ages and genders, LGBTQ Armenians had very little understanding of their attractions or that their attractions were different than their, pre than their peers. The way I explained it to everybody was like, okay, when you're growing up, Girls call other girls beautiful and hot and things like that. So did I, but I didn't know I was the only one that wanted to make out with that girl. I really just thought everybody else did too. I had no idea. As a kid, I wanted to dress in boy clothes and I was very masculine. I didn't want to wear bikinis when I went swimming. I would wear swimming trunks. I was very tomboyish almost just trying to be non-binary, and I didn't even know what that was back then. I wanted to wake up and be a boy, or dream. Please let me have a dream tonight about being a guy and being with a woman, but I never got that. I never woke up to be a man. What LGBTQ Armenians perceived about their feelings and attractions when they were young was that they were wrong. Most didn't have the language to understand or explain their feelings. The fear of repercussions for some Armenians to abandon their feelings, desires, and attempts at understanding or communicating their identities. 
As a result, LGBTQ Armenians often live double lives and find themselves compartmentalizing and compromising their identities in order to be LGBTQ and Armenian. Over and over, they expressed how their ethnic and queer identities were separate entities. Without a place for their queerness, the consequence of living two separate lives left them with feelings of resentment towards Armenians and Armenianness. Queer Armenians tend to not feel welcomed because Armenian institutions do not encourage inclusivity of otherness. Rather, they promote heteronormativity and define non-conforming genders and sexualities as other. Queer Armenians have a strong desire to open the box and help make Armenian culture more inclusive of other identities so queer Armenians will no longer have to sacrifice a part of themselves to be their whole selves. My Armenian identity was passed down to me from my parents and my community. And those two factors, parents and community, didn't give me enough healthy resources to perform my sexuality. They gave me all the resources I needed to perform my Armenianness, but I was never told, I was never given resources on how to perform my sexuality. I'm very Armenian, and I love being Armenian, but I don't feel like I belong with this community. I don't feel welcomed, and I don't feel comfortable. You can't live being in this community because there are so many cultural and social forces that are trying to shape you and mold you and keep you in this box. We can be Armenian and also be lots of other things. The only option for some is to live a double life where they're out with their significant others and accepting loved ones and in hiding with some family and community members. Queer Armenians have all at certain points had to sacrifice part of either their queer identity or Armenian identity because these components are traditionally not in harmony with one another. This is the case until the two have reconciled. I am very high said more than most, I would say. People are very shocked about that. <laughs> like, you're gay, how are you so happy about being Armenian? I'm like, hey man, what are you gonna do? They can't hold me down, they're two halves of me. I can't be one without the other. Visibility, support, and queer peers play a key role in the bridging of identities for queer Armenians. Organizations like Galas have also helped. There are two very important parts of my identity that coexist. And I'm a little arrogant actually about it. If I'm in the Armenian community or at an Armenian event, I don't have a post-it on my forehead that says I'm gay, but I'm very like, hi, I'm Yevgayim. I'm Armenian and I'm gay. So what? You know what I mean? They're both very important aspects of my identity and thank God they coexist with one another. And it took me a while to get there. I joined Galas and I made a social circle of Armenian gay friends. I made sure those two have meshed. For the longest time, these two core identities of being queer and Armenian have been fragmented. The younger generation has it somewhat easier than their older peers because they have strength in numbers. With the presence of more out Armenians, LGBTQ Armenians are redefining their identity as a single unit by queering Armenianness and refusing to abandon any of their identities. Thank you all very much. And up next, we have Nancy. Thanks for that um, presentation. It was great to hear those voices. And I um, I think there's commonality with what I'm gonna read. Um, and I also just have so many questions for you, but I'll hold on to them. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. Thanks Yala for having us. Um, you know, when unfortunate incidents happen, it's important to have space that represents the nuances and complexities of queer Armenian lives. Um, so thank you, Yala, for continuing to hold that space. So I'm going to talk to you about my new novel and how queering form applies to it. Um, so this is it, The Fear of Large and Small Nations is an autobiographical novel, which means the rough outline of Na, the narrator's story, overlaps with my experiences. I did live in Armenia for a year, like she did, and I did find myself in an abusive relationship that I needed to find my way out of but I had to fictionalize in order to find space to tell the story. Um, so I'm gonna share with you my screen momentarily. 
to sh just show you what that um, what it looks like on the page. So each chapter starts with um, a beautiful and quirky illustration by my by the illustrator and my editor Karen Kloman, and then leads into a blog post. Um, and then each chapter moves back and forth in time. The blog posts are written from Yerevan in 2006 to 2007. And then um, there are passages of meta writing where she reflects on what she's been through. Um, there are journal entries from 2011 in New York when she's trying, she's writing about trying to get herself out of this abusive relationship with Seiran. Um, you'll see another meta writing, another journal entry. You'll notice there are in different fonts and have a different appearance. Um, and then the last kind of form is a story um, which is written in third person. I found that this kind of fragmented storytelling approach helped me bring out themes to explore about diaspora and homeland relations. So in the case of the chapter, I'm gonna read from the idea of Tzavet Danem, or I'll take your pain away, um, is woven throughout those fragments. Um, and this kind of collaged approach also echoed what Na, the narrator, was going through. So as she says, her private and public selves, which she thought she had integrated over the years as a bisexual feminist Armenian American, became refractured in Armenia. And they further fracture as she endures abuse and accompanying shame. So um, I'm gonna read a sample from this chapter because it's a pivotal place in the narrative when she's starting to feel the restrictions of this kind of storytelling. Um, it also aligns with the theme of the event today of um, solidarity and community since she finds strength through the communities she's engaging with. So this is from, I'm gonna start with a journal that's dated May 25th, 2011 in a story of Queens, New York. I noticed that Sedan has been speaking more Armenian than usual. He repeats one phrase in particular, Tzavet Danam. He says it over and over again in an antagonizing tone of voice, world weary and nasal. It means something like, oh, so you think you can just go and give me your pain? I heard this phrase frequently Armenia, in Armenia. A couple of weeks ago, I went to a memorial for Marty's mother and I overheard one of his friends saying it to him, but he meant it in a kind way. I learned that Tzavet Danam literally means your pain I take. I will take your pain away. I will bear your pain for you. I love you so much, I don't want you to hurt, so I'll hurt for you. The expression seems to indicate the selflessness of the culture. Marty's mother had died 40 days before and his friends had given him a hokey hunky ceremony for her soul to rest. Afterward, in the church basement during coffee hour, I gave Marty a photo I had taken of his mother when I visited her last summer. She had put on a pretty pink outfit and lipstick and fed me chunks of sweet red watermelon. When she asked about Marty, I told her he was happier than he had been in Armenia. She suddenly burst into tears. She missed him so much, she told me. I rubbed her back, though I knew it was probably hard for her to let me see her cry. I wished I had told her about Marty more delicately, but my Armenian is so limited, I couldn't communicate nuance. Marty loved the photo and was grateful for it, but I wish I had told his mother, Tzavet Danem. I hesitated because it's one of those phrases I'm never sure I'm using in the correct context, and it seemed important not to say the wrong thing to a woman in grief 
facing the fact that she may not see her son again. Often when Sadon says the phrase, he's making fun of a provincial Yerevansi who throws around the term aggressively, like, fuck you, giving me your pain. He says it with the accent and the attitude. I think if Sadon could cry like Marty's mother or grieve like Marty, he would grow and become more human. Instead, he's become the stereotype of the brutish Armenian man he never wanted to be. Perhaps one meaning of Savat Danem could be, let me take your pain away from you, as if removing a newly arrived package of hurts from the front door and dumping it in the trash. Sadon's pain arrives daily to our apartment. He doesn't even bother with it. I pick up the box, open it, and let the pain wear me out but it's not mine to experience. One problem with taking someone's pain away is that they don't get the chance to feel it, accept it, process it, or learn something about themselves. So the narrative shifts to a story um, from June 2007 and August 2010 in Yerevan. In the woman's workshop, Na is incredibly nervous. Everyone is very nice, but she is still anxious, her breathing shallow and her teaching stilted. She's working with a group of 12 women, young, old, short, tall, local, diasporan. They range widely in their politics. Twice a week, they sit in a circle on folding chairs in the library at the Center for Armenian Women, surrounded by books. Na introduces readings about corruption and war, tradition and family, and genocide, about inhabiting a female body. The participants speak multiple languages, and Na relies on an interpreter to moderate, so the conversations can be slow, but they still cover a lot of issues. They talk about the multiplicity of languages appropriate for different situations, how they speak at home and at work, for public writing and for intimate interior and personal expression. Then they talk about how there is no Armenian word for pussy. After the discussion about the lack of Armenian words for certain body parts, they all go out for a beer afterward. It's around this time that Na stops feeling nervous. She thinks she knows why. The Armenian woman she had grown up with could be jump judgmental and combative, and she had never truly felt safe or accepted among her aunts and her mother. As she journals during the workshop, she realizes the women sitting beside her are not her family members. One day, the women in the workshop decide to go outside and write together. Soon after, they decide to create a book together. They take on different roles, translator, proofreader, editor, layout, design, marketing. They bond in a multitude of ways over the two months that they work together. They become friends. Some of the women who are queer decide to form a collective. One night before she goes to the workshop, Seiran invites Hagop, the curator, over for a visit. As she is leaving, Seiran tells her that he is going to have sex with Hagop. When she returns, Hagop is gone, and she asks how the visit was. We had very nice sex, Sadon says. Na treats it as a joke. She doesn't realize these kinds of statements are a form of abuse that will chip away at her and will spiral into something dangerous. A few years later, Na will return to teach another workshop for women, only a few sessions long, specifically centered on the female body. In this workshop attended by women who are straight, gay, pregnant, old and young, they will bond immediately. They will sit in the garden behind the center and talk about rites of passage, menstruation, marriage, family, love, sexuality, pregnancy, relationships, menopause and death. One woman leads them in yoga and they stretch toward the sky, toward each other. In the workshop, Na starts writing about the physical abuse in her relationship. Though no one else writes about such experiences, no one bats an eye when she reads the words aloud. Later, the whole group will read to an audience, including Na. A few people comment on what she wrote, indicating that they heard it, understood it, and appreciated it, and no one condemns her. Her words traveling in time from the moment of abuse in her apartment 
through her body into the space underneath the grape arbor amid the accepting energy of the group. She releases some of her shame. On her last night in Yerevan, the woman from this workshop come over to the apartment where she is staying and throw a party. They bring flowers. One woman was formerly a florist and shows Na how to strip a stem of leaves and arrange it in a vase. Another woman shows her how to make Armenian coffee. They drink wine and eat sweets and talk about writing, about life. They are celebrating creativity and their connections with each other. They take group photos by her arch Soviet window, feeling jubilant. Na doesn't think she has ever felt happier in her whole life. This is what it means to take someone's pain away. So I'll close there and I'm very excited to introduce the Hyphen Collective to hear about the organizing and the publication that they've created. So please welcome them. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so we're actually not going to read, thank you, um, anything from the book. We're just going to have a discussion that I think um, Sarah and Gabe are going to, yeah, we're, go we're going to facilitate just because um, the book itself or the zine itself is a collection of conversations between folks. So it would be a little odd to read, <laughs> read them. Um, yeah. Gabe, are you, oh, there we go. Oh, am I, am I now part of Hyphen Collective? <laughs> yeah, you're, we're, we're bringing you back in. Okay, I will lightly, lightly do this, um, but I think y'all are prepared to talk about it. Um, Sarah, you were just going to talk about like the editing process, right? And and yeah, I think we right should now. talk about sort of the inception of gatherings. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk about Kami and Ali's experience with it. Kami is part of Hyphen, but she was also a participant in the gatherings project. So they're present in one of the conversations there and Ali also participated. So they're both our authors, two of our authors for the book. So maybe they can talk a bit about their experience with it and Kami can talk about sort of the inception. Yeah, I'm happy to introduce gatherings in general um, if you all wanna chime in. Uh, essentially, Hyphen, uh, we wanted to uh, put something out and facilitate um, bring folks together to discuss solidarity in the Swana community. It was really born out of the time during the war in Artsakh um, a couple years back and uh, during a time where we were really thinking a lot about what does it look like to show and practice solidarity between Swana communities. Um, yeah, we didn't introduce us. Yeah, I that's guess. Definitely. Yeah, that's true. So I'm Kami. Um, I am a part of Hyphen. I also am an artist, a writer, a filmmaker, a multidisciplinary um, human being. Um, and we are currently in Armenia together, which is like a super special moment because <laughs> that rarely happens. But sometimes, sometimes Hyphen folks come together in Armenia. Last year it happened. Gabe was here. It was great. Um, yeah, uh, Sarah, do you want to introduce Yeah, I'm yourself? Sarah Abrams. I'm in Hyphen Collective, and I'm a writer, and I live in Armenia. Um, I'm Ali Kat. Uh, I produce my work under Entangled Roots Press, and I live in Portland, Oregon. Yes, so we are all connected in a bunch of different ways. Maybe there are some, like, other Hyphen folks in the room. I think Sevan is around. Um, with all the emojis in the comments, thank you. Uh, yeah, Sevan, the OG, the actual, and Hasmi, yay, so many people. Um, yeah, so yeah, gatherings essentially was that, was like we wanted to pair folks to have conversations around Swana solidarity. So Ali had a conversation with Layla, mm -hmm. I had a conversation with Dahlia, um, Dahlia is a, an amazing, uh, Kurdish friend of mine who basically we just took our Instagram DM conversations and put them into gatherings. Cause that's like already what we were talking about a lot. And then, 
um, Layla is like a really dope Lebanese um, writer, plant worker, and like overall extraordinary. Yeah, so we paired Ali and Layla because they both, both of their work touches on like plant, um, plant remembrance and ancestral reclamation work. Um, and so we were interested in hearing them have a conversation around solidarity specific to that topic or uh, what that could look like um, between, yeah, between different Swana communities. Um, and that's pretty much it, I think, as a good intro to the to the zine for those who haven't looked at it or read it. Um, and then, yeah, Sarah, if you want to talk a little bit about the editing process. Sure. I mean, further than that, the idea for the zine was that we pair people up and we have them talk about the idea of Swana solidarity. And we have them somehow, in whichever way they prefer, transcribe the conversation. And we take a look at it and we put it in the book. And that was pretty much it. Yeah, there was pretty minimal editing, I yeah. think. It was pretty much just like the conversation in and of itself that mm -hmm. um, existed on the page. Um, we thought that would be a little bit of a lighter, honestly, it was a bit of a, like, it was editor from the editorial point of view, it was a bit of a lighter, uh, pull for us, which <laughs> like, yeah, hyphen is like obviously volunteer based collective. So we were trying to kind of take, um, yeah. And then also to represent folks, like their words and their discussions and like a really, um, honest and authentic way as well. Um, yeah, I don't know, Ellie, if you want to speak to your experience as a participant, I can... Yeah, so um, I was paired with Layla, who, as Kami mentioned, is this amazing plant worker um, of Lebanese descent, and we ended up just having a video chat, and we, like, recorded it, and then just had it transcribed, and we spent a lot of our time discussing kind of, like, the concept of solidarity and, like, discussing like what words really mean, like when we're using them and like from different language standpoints, from different um, views on things. So like Layla was like, I don't really always like the word solidarity. And like, we're talking about like solidarity versus relationship and like how those two are the same or are different and what things mean. So we have like a same basis to stand on and like what when we're using these words, like the the gravity or the importance and like the actions that come with those things was like very much like a forefront to our conversation. So yeah, I don't know what else to say, but it was a really good experience. Um, it was really beautiful conversations just so like through everyone's, like I, was, I didn't see anyone's writings until it was published, um, but everyone just had like such an amazing viewpoint. And there were so many things talked about different concepts like different forms of uh, ways that people connected to each other across different different experiences. Yeah, and just to say a little bit more about the call out process, essentially mm -hmm. we ask people to either come as pairs or to um, or that or to come with a with a with a, an opening or to request that they we match them up with folks. So it was a little bit of a mixed bag in that sense, and that mm -hmm. was kind of fun. Um, because yeah, some folks showed up with their own idea that was like kind of fully formed and knew what they wanted to talk about and discuss and others just kind of came with, this is what I'd like to discuss if there is something aligned. Um, can you pair me up or match me up with someone that um, makes sense? So I think it worked pretty, pretty well in terms mm -hmm. of form. It was a pretty like fun and exciting form to play with and to, yeah, to work with. Nice. And Flo, who I don't think is around, is also part of Hyphen and did the layout design. And it was a really interesting process mm -hmm. to find a way to represent the words on the page in a way that like felt good and made sense and reflected the actual conversational nature of the text itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I kind of wish that they were here to speak to that. I know. Yeah, but before it was published, they were releasing little bits of text from the zine which mm -hmm. was really interesting it was very like draw drew you in yeah and it was yeah I love that yeah it's very very good in terms of the editing process I can speak to that a bit I mean um it was it was a fun project to edit because you have material coming from all different formats and all different people from all over the world some of them were done over text some of them were done in a document some of them I think were on the phone and then later transcribed so there were all these things you sort of had to take into account in order to keep the authenticity there while also keeping some sort of um 
standard there as well and making it cohesive. Mm -hmm. So it was important for us to keep that authenticity and the nuances in the different ways that people spoke with each other, whether it's because of their geographic location or because of their own style or because of the format they were writing in. So as an editor, you had to engage in that to a certain point to actually understand the conversation and edit it properly. So it was fun. Yeah, and we don't have the luxury of having voice recordings like for Z, which I think is a really <laughs> cool idea actually for a yeah, gathering type those thing. Were, those are fun. Um, I wanna ask, because it feels like we're just gonna start going into a bit of the Q&A here, <clears throat> which I think was the idea. Mm -hmm. But um, the other two works that we discussed are explicitly queer. And the gathering hyphen itself is, an explicitly queer collective, Armenian collective, but I think it's a little bit funny. We sort of took that for granted when it came to gatherings, we didn't talk about it being queer and we were really focused on the solidarity aspect, um, but we're here because there is still something very queer about gatherings. So I wondered if one or all of you want to talk about what makes gatherings queer and why um <laughs> why we maybe didn't think about that maybe it's because we are a bit of that younger generation and we have that strength in numbers that rosie talked about and we're just like well you know obviously it's gay but um, <laughs> but we're not talking about it being gay right like we're talking about it sort of queering the narratives that were um sharing um so if one of you wants to talk about that so I remember at the beginning we we discussed whether like what the format was going to be if we're having people have conversations and talk to each other and then transcribe it and then publish it in a book what could that look like and the easy answer of course is just have the conversations there like like a script you know and we decided on that and we we're kind of trying to think of like examples of other people who have done that and um so I don't know, we're playing with the form in that way, I think. And each chapter as well, like each conversation in the book is a bit different from the other one because they had to be. And we wanted to honor the diversity of the conversations themselves. Yeah, I think they're like, in terms of how it's queer, I think, yeah, because I don't know, there's been a, a big conversation around like, just because we are queer, does that mean that everything we do is queer? I don't know, but I know I also know that there is this like, it's pretty popular now to just put make the word queer into a verb and then it just becomes like a concept, you know, and that's cool and great. I think like maybe it is a matter of like us just you were mentioning us being young. I don't know if I would consider myself like young. I'm a bit of an in-betweener, but I would say like I think, yeah. It's a question. Is everything we do as queer folks just queer? Like, is every film I'm going to make a queer film just because I am queer? I don't know. Are we past it? I don't, I'm never going to tell someone to not identify their work as queer, you know, but I don't, yeah, this is a question that I feel like I, I brought up in a past Isla or some, in a previous conversation where uh, I think JP, you were there. Remember we were talking about, I'm like, is everything that I do moving forward just going to be queer about queer writing, queer book, queer film, just because, you know, and, and like my, my content is always going to include queer characters, but is it going to be about that? Or is it just going to be about like the human experience being a human? And um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's like a question, question mark for sure. I could see it just being queer as in the idea that like, we're just always here. So just like the solidarity and like being across cultures and stuff like you maybe we don't see it in the mainstream of like you know Armenians and L people from Lebanon and Palestine and Kurdistan and anywhere else you're talking about like that that solidarity exists it's like it's always been there it's just like us like we're here and like just by existence like yes it is queer <laughs> thanks <laughs> right it's queer as in just kind of heterodox like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll talk about it. Um, so I want to just ask um, 
the way I see that queerness coming through is just like challenging the typical relationships that we have. And I think for both of um, the contributors present for Kami's piece and for Ali's piece, there's really a lot of talk about relationships, um, whether it's between people, which also comes up in the other two works that we talk about, um, but also like between the land, uh, like people and land. And I wonder if that's something that Ali could talk about right now, because I think that that is sort of a queering relationship, but it's also more than just that. Um, so if you want to talk about that a little bit, a little bit, because it's also sort of the subtext in a lot of um, what we've talked about today. It's like our connection to land, our belonging in a certain place or whatever. I love that you three are all in Armenia right now. I'm really jealous because that is so rare, um, but it's also like kind of exactly what we're talking about. It's like you make this pilgrimage there and you feel connection and that's different, a different experience and relationship than, than I'm having right now here in Oakland. Um, so if you want to talk about that, I think that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, I guess like with Layla and I, was like our discussion about land, you know, it was really like kind of like a more general concept than like the actual physical borders that we tend to talk about today. It's like a connection to where you are from or where your roots are from. And I think that's kind of like something to go back to because so often like our divisions are over like modern day borders or modern day wars or even old ones like when we we're talking about things where people aren't connecting or aren't seeing things together or don't want to work with like solidarity movements together is because of like divisions that are created that aren't from the land or from the people and um we just had a discussion about that um and like what that kind of relationship means and I'm just going to ask one more question and I think we can like kind of open it up mm. to the rest of the group. Um, as Kami said, and as we've talked about a little bit, um, gatherings kind of came out of the 2020 Arts Off War and to be plain, just like dissatisfaction, just like kind of being fed up with the social media sort of discourse um around solidarity around war um kami mentions like oppression olympics and just like the political divisiveness and wanting to get away from all that so i want to ask kami more directly and all of you like what has been your recourse um to get away from that, obviously hyphen uh, gatherings being one thing that we did in, as an alternative to that. Um, but like, what are you continuing to do? And are you still on the like, you know, fuck the social media train? Um, I think I am. I like kind of stopped using <laughs> social media since, since 2020. Like I just really am not here for it very much. Um, but what are we doing otherwise? Um, and why is that like more significant? What are you, what is your takeaway from that? I'm not going to lead that question, but like, what are you doing and why? Yeah, it's funny. Like I'll speak as Kami is like a, yeah, I am also, it's funny. I'm the communications manager for like a, for a global feminist organization. So I can't officially say fuck social media, but I will say that unofficially, unofficially <laughs> off the record, um, this is on the record, JP reminded us <laughs> maybe 80 times, but yeah, I, um, you know, yeah, I have definitely feeling pretty, um, I don't want to use the word hopeless because I use that word too often, not super hopeful about, um, <laughs> about, yeah, like I think gatherings was like, a really great thing for us to work on and not just us it was really because honestly when the war started I reached out to my Kurdish and Palestinian friends and I was like how do you do this shit every day you know and that's where I was like I want I need I think I need these conversations to be public because I think more folks can actually benefit from reading about this and reading this and uh you know like um and so I think um 
that's that's really at the root of it for me in terms of is what we're you know everybody everybody's trying their best everybody's doing what they can and I think we are doing what we can to stay sane in a very insane uh, world, you know, and situation and political context. Mm -hmm. What I will say, just to sort of wrap um, or to like speak into in a future sense, is that what came out of gatherings that I think was, and particularly, I'll speak again for myself in my conversation with Dahlia and Gabe, I think you mentioned this in previous conversations. Um, was was the the obstacle to solidarity was this like a lot there's a lot of infighting that happens so so for me what came out of gatherings that was super fascinating was learning that okay so maybe uh yes solidarity but also solidarity with our with our own selves and with our own communities right mm -hmm. so like the infighting is so real in swana communities and it, i thought the armenians were the only ones but then talking to my kurdish and palestinian friends they were just like oh no 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 that's also going to be our downfall our greatest downfall right and and is and like will continue to be you know not to be a pessimist but like it's something that i think about a lot and i i know that i've talked to like the other folks in hyphen about a next iteration of gatherings uh i'm really interested in exploring this idea of like you know, we are our own Davajans, like we are our own traitors, like, um, and like the cavalry is not coming, you know, it's not going to be the West, it's not going to be the East, we can blame, like, Russia, America, Europe, Nigo, like we can blame everyone, but we need to also look inside ourselves to, you know, and I, I'm interested in in that and that's what came out of my conversation with Dahlia we were talking about that and that's kind of honestly the privilege of diaspora in a way and the downfall of it right we're removed from it and um that's been my experience that that's kind of why I, I I pulled back from social a lot because I'm like this is actually not helping we're just in this feedback loop mm -hmm. of pointing fingers and uh we're not able to really like face the music um within ourselves you know as people from this region with all the things we have to you know deal with so yeah and also just to circle back really quick about like we were talking about being here and like mm -hmm. I think also uh the diaspora experience is like inherently a queer experience because like when you come here I've been coming to Armenia every year since I was five years old right so if in 92 was the first time I came to Armenia I'm 36 years old now, and I still feel like an outsider here. So whether I'm in my community in Armenia and I'm the outsider because I'm like loud, feminist, and queer, like, sorry, when I'm in my community in Toronto and I'm because I'm loud, feminist, and queer there, I'm also kind of an outsider. And then like I come here and I'm an outsider because I'm like not from here, you know what I mean? So I feel like there is like a resonance between the diaspora experience and the queer experience in that sense. I don't know others feel that way but yeah yeah that's why queer armos love forming collectives that's wow. true yeah. we are so love true. it but we were the first <laughs> <laughs> yes thank yes and shout out to Sevan for that yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Sevan left <laughs> I, <can't laughs> I got reconnected to my Armenian roots like oh I was living in Argentina, the other side of my family, and I found them online and I was like, wow, that exists like that, like I can be queer and Armenian, like, that's amazing. That should so, be our slope. Yeah, I, yeah, like that exists. I can be queer. Yeah, oh, wait, that exists. yeah. We exist. Yeah. That I've exists. Been <laughs> I've been <laughs> on to the 70s, who's queer and lives in the Bay, and I told her about it and she did not believe me. Wow. I show, I brought her a zine, the first original hyphen zine. She's like, oh. didn't know it existed. That's it really, beautiful. really cute. Thank you. Um, well, on that note, I will say social media is good for one thing, and that is getting people to events like this um, so that we can actually yeah. talk to each other and be in dialogue. And, and as a tool of accessibility for... Yeah. 
we can come together from all around the world um, or the country or wherever. Um, so I'm going to like kind of transition into a larger group discussion. I know that um, other people have questions, but yeah, I think that that's the, that's the whole point. It's just coming together and being in, in relationships with one another and giving each other that lifeline. Like Savit Danam is not about erasing the pain. It's not about just ignoring it. Like it's about coming together and saying, hey, like we actually share this and I'm gonna hold it with you and we're gonna feel into it and not pretend that it doesn't exist. So um, let's do that with the whole group now. Everybody get out your pain and let's talk about it. Well, real quick, I want to. There is a question for Nancy in the chat from Maru. Question for Nancy I'm curious about the revision process for the excerpt that you read. There's such an elegant weaving throughout the different scenes of the concept and literal Armenian language that signals the caring or lack for each other. How did you achieve that weaving? Was it through multiple drafts? Did you know that this was what you were doing initially as in a conscious decision early on, or did it come about later in the writing process? Thanks, uh, Mahu, and thanks, Hyphen. Um, I wanted to say how much I appreciated in gatherings, which I have a copy, um, that, yeah, um, how much the, the thread that I saw and really liked was about negotiating language. And so I think you made a space for people to be together in language. And uh, like um, Ali and Layla talking about, well, what does solidarity really mean? And what do we need in this case kind of thing? So, um, and in terms of the question, yeah, it was a long process. I, it, the book originally, I was intending to write a nonfiction book and I did keep a blog when I was in Armenia. And my first intention was it was gonna be like informational um, and kind of, and reported. And then um, as I was going through this blog and trying to write a narrative, I was in a terrible relationship and in order to write from the present about what I'd been through the past and through that lens, um, I found myself writing about it and the people in my writing group encouraged me and said, yeah, that's part of the story too. And it, over time it evolved, it felt like both stories of what I'd experienced and seen in Armenia among the friends I made and then what I was experiencing in the relationship, they could each inform each other and metaphors formed and especially around sort of perceptions that we have about each other and the myths and stories we tell ourselves about what it means to be Armenian um, and what it means to be queer. So, um, it was when I started writing about myself in third person that everything kind of clicked together. And I thought, okay, I'll have, um, it helps to have this grounding blog post at, at each chapter. And then it helped me to write about the personal story in the third person to get some distance. And then I could weave in the journal and the meta writing to reflect. Um, and at the time, it felt like um, that it reflected really well Nas' situation. Um, but I also thought that I saw around me a lot of um, people in Armenia working in a fragmented way with collage. Um, so it, it, that's how that all came about. It was just a gradual revisioning um, and, and peeling away each time I went through a draft. 
it's it's kind of like a novel that a nonfiction writer would write because um, there's all these reflective passages where she's trying to figure out what she's been through. Um, so I really, each chapter is more theme structured or oriented than it is like a plot that like you have to, you know, where you get intrigued with what's going to happen next. Um, I wanted to write about all these different dynamics in this form of personal and observational writing helped me to do that. I want to take that thread a little bit further because like defining language was a big part of some of the gatherings contributions for sure. And then I think in, in your book, Nancy, you, you have to define language as you kind of are speaking, maybe not just to an Armenian audience. Um, you're bringing it to the, you know, literary world. Um, but then I think that's also going to be seen in Rosie's work too. Um, kind of having to define what you're talking about. And that's obviously a research, uh, more of a research thing. So there's a, a couple things I want to talk about. Uh, you, Nancy, in your excerpt, you say like, oh, there's no, there's no word for pussy in Armenian, um, which is not a word I like to say, except on camera. Um, but, um, and, and actually like Sarah and I were just talking about this sort of phenomenon the other day, like a lot of people romanticize like, oh, Armenian doesn't have gendered pronouns. Um, as if Armenian then doesn't have sexism. Um, it's like, no, that's not true at all. Um, that's just like a kind of practical quirk about the language. Um, also, I'll acknowledge that like na is the name of your character. And that is also the pronoun that is used as a gender as the pronoun in Armenian, it being gender neutral. So I think that that's a nice touch. But um, I guess my point is just because language doesn't exist doesn't mean what it describes doesn't impact us. Um, so creating that language and defining that language collectively is like really important because that gives people the ability to talk about it. And that is like what almost has been mentioned throughout all of this. Um, so in Rosie's work, it's like, I didn't know how, I didn't have the tools to perform my sexuality. I didn't have these tools because they weren't talked about, whether in Armenian or not. Um, and that also I think is relating to, um, Nancy, you saying like you had to start writing in third person to kind of get at, and that, that it's semi-biographical and you had to start fictionalizing it to actually tell the truth, which is a really interesting thing. So that I think on the other end of that, we have Rosie's work, which is research. And I think there's pressure in research to sort of like tell objective truths. Um, so I'm wondering, Rosie, like if you could talk about that for a second, how the pressure to like sort of tell a truth and whether or not that's really possible, even as you conduct these interviews and stuff. Like, is there truth? Is it fiction once you put it on a page? Like, is, is it true once you put it on a page? Like, what is that like? And how does that play into your uh, experience doing that research? Yeah, um, so I don't feel pressure. I think part of it is because I got my PhD in Armenian studies at UCLA under Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Because it's an intersectional field, I got to use intersectional approaches. And so um, it wasn't the, the sociological approach of hypothesis and answer, let's say. So I've had more freedom in my work, which is why I get to write it like a creative nonfiction piece as well. Um, but I think the beauty in the work, and because I got to do, I was fortunate enough to, to do over 50 interviews with LGBTQ Armenians, I got a wide range of experiences. And so 
I think the truths are in the nuances and the complexities that you find. Um, so even if one person's story isn't your story, one aspect of their story will be something you can relate to. Yeah, it's sort of more like a tapestry of truth. Like you can kind of, it's a buffet of truths. Um, that's sort of what we're getting in gatherings too, I think. Um, yeah, I think that that's one of the really powerful things. Like we did, we talked about this in, in our preparation for this. It's like, we're all doing anthropology. We're all doing sociology. We're all creating fiction and stories. Um, I want to go back now to Ali's piece um, because um, we're talking about like narratives and, and truths or or however we want to think about it and in Ali's piece there's a lot of talk about like the land and the relationship to the land and what we're learning from it and what we're learning from ancestors through their relationship with the land um it the idea of like the land having its narrative I think was something that I got out of that so I was wondering if you could talk about that um but also I loved the idea that like we are sort of inseparable from that from the land like it's, it's in us whether we're living in our traditional homelands or whatever like Armenia for all of us Armenia isn't actually like where our families are are from for at least the hyphen present um the present hyphen people on screen <laughs> I don't speak for all of us but like you know and so what does that mean when we're somewhere else um and then is that I see that as like kind of queer like our bodies are land and that is queer like we're not these rational minds you know we are actually something way more complex so if you could talk about that I would I would love to hear about that yeah um like Layla and I were both like you know in the diaspora and have visited like our homelands and like you mentioned like I'm not from this Armenia and this iteration like my ancestors didn't see Ararat from this viewpoint like the other side um but like part of that like reclamation and relearning reconnection is something that we can attribute to where we are today and then that relationship and Layla and I talked about like a lot of like being in solid like that idea of solidarity or relationship or whatever you want to call it is like understanding like where your place exists I wouldn't say where your place is but where your place exists and so like when you're in North America, like understanding like the plants that you're with, like the history there, the indigenous peoples who continue to live there and how they are a relationship with their land. And while we might not have that in the same like physical space, like how we can like learn to cultivate that in like the place that we are and how to continue those relationships where we are and like where our solidarities are built upon is like how we understand what like what lessons we're being taught what lessons we can continue to learn and it's like a continual like growth and it is something that we are always exploring and it's never like a, a it will never be a finished thing this is something we are always moving towards like utopias on the horizon is a piece that a part I talked about in the essay it's like one of my favorite quotes from this Argentine author Eduardo Galeano and he says utopias on the horizon I walk two steps towards her, she walks two steps further. She, I walk 10 steps towards her, she walks 10 steps further. What is utopia good for? Utopia is good for walking. And that is always what we're doing. We're always moving towards something better, whether that's our relationships, our understanding of ourselves, who we are, where we exist in the world, our solidarity with each other. Like we always have more work to do. You know, wow. that actually, if I can jump in here, um, that actually leads into a really great audience question uh, that came in at, from Emma. Thank you, Emma. As was mentioned, there is a resonance of otherness between Armenian and queer identities. Uh, Emma feels often this resonance comes from a place of scarcity. And imagining queer Armenian futures, how do you imagine we might approach these relationships with solidarity instead of or while also honoring hopelessness, this theme of solidarity as a verb? 
What form does a queer Armenian future take in your dreams or speculations? And that is for the group. <laughs> so Nancy or Rosie or Hyphen, if you want to, any one of you can go first and then we can open it up to the rest. I think I can answer it in terms of queering families from a research perspective. One of the things I look into is queer Armenian families. And to me, they really are the future um, in the way they approach parenthood, um, in the way they approach family building. Um, it very much is with more thought and care and freedom and openness. It's without shame. So they are challenging traditional notions of parenthood and painting a new vision of what an Armenian family is. So that gives me a lot of hope. Nancy or Hyphen, do you want to also take a perspective at that question? You don't have to if you don't want to. Gabe, the question can also be for you as well as our facilitator and the work that you've done. Yeah, uh, I love like the idea of utopian futures. I, it's, but I approach it from a very like academic kind of standpoint so far. Um, I just think that like going forward, like we're all gonna have to sort of be in tighter relationships with one another. And I think that might arise for like practical reasons. Like we might not have the resources to move across the world with such ease as we do now. Um, and also our communities are just, they're gonna have to strengthen if we wanna have alternative more sustainable forms of society. Um, it's <laughs> queer Armenian future, like ideally, like there is, <laughs> don't take this the wrong way, but like there is no like queer Armenian future. Like we're gonna, we're all just going to find this place where naming that stuff isn't something we have to do so forcefully. Um, and I think that comes from a place of privilege to say something like that, but also like, I think that that is where we're moving. Um, there was one more question from the audience that I think we can hit before we go into more of the discussion part. Um, and it was for Nancy. So the question is, Nancy, these fragmented perspectives felt like the narrative form elucidating the meaning of the story where the collage of disjointed sections mimics Nas collaging of selves, styles, and voices. How does that relate to queer identity? Yeah, I think that um, she's giving herself space through this collage to express something she can't express any other way. And I think that putting into words is what leads to um, embodying or actualizing or living. Um, and it's kind of the process that she engages. And I, I do think that's queer to make space for ourselves, however we find it, whether it starts out in, internally and then moves externally with other folks. Um, yeah, and I guess that, you know, in terms of the, I think it was Emma Shushan's question, of, I think, like, being, and jumping on what you said, Gabe, just this idea that, uh, of change, like, um, having, access and openness to changing um, and not getting so attached to what we think something should be, whether it's in ourselves or with other people.
I hate to be the host that steps in and has to be the timekeeper because who wants to stop this conversation from going? But we do have uh, after this an informal social hour that there are some uh, comments that are coming in the chat. So it'd be really lovely um, for those to kind of help keep the conversation going in a more socializing sense, if you will. Please, everyone, thank our uh, the Hyphen Collective, Gabe, as our facilitator, Nancy and Rosie, for being here with us today and sharing their work. I guess we can't really hear the applause. Um, I do want to say that Yala has put out a statement regarding the events that occurred this past week in Glendale. It is posted on our website and um, through our social media. There are resources included in that as well. Thank you. Again, thank you so much, at our panelists, for being here today and the conversation for all of you for joining us here today. We are going to stop the recording. You can stay on, though. We will continue the conversation, and we will see you at our next event. On behalf of Yala, thank you very much, everyone.